Well, joining our Thursday panel to discuss that and everything else that's kicking around this building, Liberal MP Melissa McIntosh and Labor MP Kate Thwaites. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Uh, Melissa McIntosh, I want to start with you on this announcement about boosters. I mean, your community, like, like Kate's, has been going through lockdowns for much of this year. Vaccination has been the key to getting out of it. Do you think that there's going to be a situation in the next couple of months where, as people are due for their boosters, they might forget to do it because they've kind of gone back to life as normal and thought that the, the worst is behind us? I'm really proud of my community's vaccination rates. We're in well above 90% for first and over well over 87% uh, for second. Uh, so I think we have a, a real focus on being vaccinated. It's wonderful news that Atagi has given the OK for the booster for people that have had their vaccinations at least six months prior. Uh, and that's part of my job, informing my community, making sure that they're staying up to date with the latest health advice. So I have no doubt that people in my community will be getting uh, that extra booster shot and people want to be out and about. This is great news. We can now move freely within our community. We can almost travel overseas as of next week. It'll be wonderful when we can also travel within our own country. In Kate Thwaites, I mean, we hear about there being some disparity between um, vaccination rates in not only in, in cities but in states, in various uh, ethnic communities, the Indigenous population falling behind. What are you going to be looking out for uh, in your community over the next couple of months as we start talking about boosters and also clearing up the, the first initial uh, doses as well? It's such a good question, Matt, because like Mel, my community has done a wonderful job of getting out and getting vaccinated, but they did have to wait too long and it was very confusing in the early stages. And those early stages were when vulnerable people were meant to be vaccinated. But I do know that we still don't have enough Indigenous people vaccinated. There's still a big problem in the disability community with people with disability seeking vaccines. And so we do need to hear more from the government about how they plan to address that, as well as how they plan to make sure that people who are a priority for boosters, get that booster and know they're eligible, know where to go. So I'm looking for a lot more from the government on that. Do you think, Melissa McIntosh, there is a risk some people could be left behind in this process from that initial cohort? So the Indigenous population, a lot being said about, about their rates far lower than the broader population? In my own community, uh, where we have over 6,000 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander uh, people, we've done really well with our vaccination rates because the community has been very much involved uh, and the vaccinations have taken place in that community and community leaders have uh, come behind that. So speaking on behalf of my community, we're doing OK. And I, I've spoken to the, the minister uh, about this and, and that is one of his core focus is, is ensuring that the vaccination rates among Aboriginal communities, particularly in remote areas, uh, uh, that we're doing everything we can in that regard. But the good thing is, as the Health Minister announced today, that Pfizer is going to be available shortly in pharmacies. So there's going to be enough vaccinations, uh, vaccines in our country for everyone to get that first shot, that second shot, and now getting the booster shot. I do want to move on to another issue, and we just heard from uh, our election analyst, Anthony Green, about this voter ID bill. Kate Thwaites, quite handy having you here today because you're actually on uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. What are the concerns here from Labor about disenfranchising members of the community? I mean, if we all have to show up to vote and compulsory voting is a feature of the Australian electoral system, why not ask people to show their ID? Matt, this is a really concerning proposal and it is straight out of the Trump playbook of undermining our democracy. It will make it more difficult for Australians to vote. It will mean some Australians will not be able to vote. It will mean all of us wait longer in a queue on voting day. And there's just no evidence for it. So, as you said, I do sit on the committee that oversees how um, elections happen and reviews how elections happen in this country. And the evidence we've heard is there's no evidence of voter fraud in Australia. The Australian Electoral Commission has not asked for these powers. It doesn't think there's a problem here. So at the last minute, in the lead up to the election, we've got the government moving a law which will stop people from voting. It's really concerning. It's not about integrity. If the government was about integrity, they'd do something about Christian Porter's blind trust or they'd get us a National Integrity Commission. Well, on that, Kate Thwaites makes the point that the Electoral Commission themselves aren't asking for these powers. Why is the government therefore pushing them? Well, it's about bringing Australia up to date with the rest of the world. And these are like-minded liberal democracies that have uh, identifications in place. The UK is now doing it right across Europe. And what we want to do is to prevent fraud 
but to the fraud's not happening, Mel. The fraud's just not there. Any part, any even a tiny bit of fraud is too much fraud. It's and not when a it problem. Comes you to, are just stopping people from voting. When it comes to people voting. being able... No, that's not correct. Because you correct. can go there still, and if you don't have your identification, uh, you can do a declaration. So the question really is, why is Labor focused so much on us not uh, putting this through and having people showing their identification when we just want to prevent fraud. It is something that's been recommended by the Joint Standing Committee a couple of times yeah. now. Why acting on it now as opposed to when those recommendations were made in, after the 2016 election and I believe also after the 2013 poll? Well, the question is why not act on it now? What we're doing is putting through a bill now and it's to strengthen uh, our voting system to make sure that there is even the tiniest amount of fraud is not happening and to bring us up to date uh, with the rest of the world uh, where there is best practice. And it's, we actually it's no have different. one of we the best provide, electoral processes We have to provide identification And now. there is no evidence uh, for in, needing in numbers of ways. We'll come back to you in just a moment, Kate Thwaites, but I do want to hear, hear Melissa's answer here. Yeah, what I was saying, in, in all parts of life, people are used to showing identification. Uh, so it's not going to be a, a burden on the Australian people at all. I think people expect us to be the right, doing the right thing when it comes to ensuring there is absolutely no fraud going on when it comes to voting. Okay, Thwaites, so you've pointed out there that there is very little fraud being identified here. The concern that Labor has about disenfranchising people, are we talking about what, what, what elements of the community, what groups in the community are, are you most concerned will be hampered in exercising their right to vote by this, this proposal? Well, any Australian could be affected by this proposal. The groups we're most concerned about are people who may not have ready access to ID. So they can write a declaration. Now, can so I stop no now? Uh, finish. That is people who um, may be uh, fleeing situations of family violence, people in remote Indigenous communities where we know people already find it very hard to vote, uh, homeless people. There are groups of people for whom this is really difficult. And I say again, this has not been identified as a problem. We actually have one of the most uh, intact, uh, above the board electoral systems in the world. So why is this government borrowing straight from the Trump playbook minutes before an election? It is dangerous. It is an attack on our democracy. Well, when it's in Europe, when it's across the UK, it's not the Trump playbook. And as I said, you don't have to have identification. If you don't have it, you can do a declaration. So that, that argument is absolutely false. OK, I do want to move on because there is one other big issue that's been lingering throughout this uh, building for much of the week and that is this deal between the Liberals and the Nationals on net zero, this new target that the Prime Minister is taking to the Glasgow Climate Summit. Uh, Melissa McIntosh, how do you explain to people in your community, if they're asking you about the merits of this proposal, how it's been worked out? Because we haven't got the modelling, we haven't got the detail behind these assertions that tens of thousands of jobs will be created, families could be thousands of dollars better off over the next couple of decades. How, how do you explain to people what that, that message is when you, there isn't actually that evidence to back it up? Well, I'm glad, glad you asked me that question uh, because speaking with people in my community was one of the first things uh, that I did as we approached these weeks, and particularly manufacturers, uh, ensuring that they're brought along. And, and they've said to me uh, that they are very supportive of, of this, uh, but they don't want industry negatively impacted. And that's why we're so focused on technology. So it's no surprise uh, that we are not going to be mandating farmers, we're not going to be mandating uh, industry, that we're going to be bringing them along and backing them all the way. And that's what's important for my community. So why can't the government outline that, that uh, modelling that underpins this target as it presents the plan. It oh, seems like it's asking for trust yeah. here when, when the, 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 the track history on this issue has been so incredibly fraught. Well, our track history is that we're meeting and beating our targets and the PM has made it very clear that he'll be releasing that modelling in the next few weeks. Kate Waits, what do you think people need to look out for when that modelling does actually get, get released? What do you and, and Labor think are going to be the sticking points here? Matt, I think what's so disappointing about what has happened this week is, you know, we came to Parliament thinking that the decades-long climate war was over. And we came thinking that after eight years of inaction, the Morrison government was going to give us a plan and was going to show us how we were going to achieve net zero, how the Prime Minister was going to go to Glasgow with a serious target, and none of 
that has happened. Instead, what we've had is Barnaby Joyce do a secret deal of which we know none of the details other than that Keith Pitt is back in the Cabinet. Uh, and now we have Barnaby Joyce in charge of our country while Scott Morrison goes to Glasgow, you know, someone who said he doesn't actually think net zero is necessary. So what I'm concerned about is we haven't seen the modelling, the target won't be legislated, there's nothing in the plan, and we've got the Prime Minister now jetting off to Glasgow, taking nothing, we're being left behind the rest of the world who are transitioning, and the impact of that for all of us, for our industries, for our farmers and for all of our communities is that we miss out on the jobs and the opportunities of the future. And it is just a massive failure of leadership. And I can tell you from my community, people are so fed up with this. They know that we need action on climate change. They know that we are being left behind and they thought this week was going to be different. But instead, we got more of the same from this Joyce Morrison government. On the issue of, of leadership, uh, the global community has been demanding that Australia and other countries show up to the Glasgow summit with far more ambitious short-term uh, carbon emissions reduction targets, for, so for 2030. The Prime Minister says that's not something that Australia is going to do. Doesn't he risk being laughed off the international stage here no, as a result? Hardly. We're one of the only countries in the world that uh, has a target that we're beating, that has a plan and that is growing the economy at the same time. And the PM made it very clear uh, as we took it to the last election election that I uh, was elected to be the member for Lindsay that uh, we wouldn't be uh, changing uh, our 2030 targets. And we're looking at uh, being 30 to 35 per cent. Um, but hasn't the science changed in that intervening period to say that the emergency, the climate emergency, is far greater than what was thought before? Well, you've just got to look at how we're compared to, comparing to other countries where we're actually uh, well ahead in that regard. Kate Thwaites, I mean, 2030, we hear a lot about uh, Labor wanting to be more ambitious than the government, but when will we start to see the detail of Labor's 2030 targets? Because they're, they're still under wraps as well. That's a really good question. Well, look, we knew that um, the Prime Minister wanted to update the 2030 targets, but Barnaby Joyce wouldn't let him. And so, you know, Labor would love to be able to take Australia's targets to Glasgow. We can't. We're not the government. This is on Scott Morrison. So he wanted it. He couldn't land it. Barnaby Joyce stopped him. Barnaby Joyce is driving the climate policy of this country. Labor's been really clear that we will have a credible uh, climate policy in place. And in fact, we have a number of big initiatives already on the table, rewiring the nation so that we can harness renewable electricity, community batteries for the same purpose. We will legislate net zero and we will have more to say before the election. So unlike the other side, who just don't believe in climate change, who are being led by Barnaby Joyce on this, we will have a credible policy in place. Why is it okay. any surprise that uh, the nationals are behind farmers and back